Hi, everybody. Welcome to this evening's conversation with our host, Glenn Grossman. I can't believe we are almost wrapping up March here, 2021. Thrilled to be together tonight. We're broadcasting here. Glenn is downstairs. I am upstairs. We're lucky to be in the same location this time. But thrilled to have you with us, those are who are here live and those who are joining via YouTube. Thank you for joining us. So as many of us know, Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn served as an epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and at UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology forecasting and advanced analytics with Bristol-Myers Squibb, Sanofi, Sinar uh, Novartis, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military Health Service, the CDC, and other programs within the United States and abroad. As always, all views expressed today are his own. All right, Glenn, how are, how are things looking here, uh, both in the US and abroad? Thanks for the introduction, Rebecca. So let's see, I am sharing my screen. All right, so, um, so basically, things are getting a little bit worse, um, pretty much in the New York City metro area. And um, you can see New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, up in the Northeast, things are, are getting worse fa faster. But in much of the rest of the country, we're also moving from yellow back to orange again, unfortunately. Um, so we're hoping we don't enter into another fourth surge, but I'll, I'll show you some, some pictures of where we are. Um, give me one second, let me pause this too. Get another website that I like to go to, which is this one. All right, so this website is useful because it breaks it down by state. And so let me move this down. All right, so here is, I oh know this is Texas, that's not what we want. Texas is sort of leveling off a little bit. We remember that Texas had sort of eliminated some of their mask rules and some of their other rules that we had. Here's New Jersey. Let me let me bring this up because right now that's where I live and it's also currently doing poorly and getting worse. Um, and so this is what New Jersey looks like. Um, so you can see when we talk about the United States in general doing well uh, or, or not doing so poorly, you can see that New Jersey is actually not going in the right direction of where the rest of the country is. It's been like this for a month or so, um, but it's we're not doing any better. And everyone, I, I think a lot of people who live in New Jersey don't even realize this. And so everyone figures, oh, the country's doing well, we're on the right track, and they don't realize that, that we're actually still in trouble. And in fact, you, when you see how high we are, we're roughly where we are, where we were back in Thanksgiving, um, which is not a good place. It's not where we wanna be. Luckily, when so this is cases, when we look at deaths, uh, so this again, this is what we were just looking at in terms of where the cases are happening. When we look at deaths, you'll see it's not the same, the same states. Um, so we're not doing quite as poorly. So some states like Georgia and Kentucky are actually doing worse than us in terms of the death rate. Um, and that's largely because of the vaccinations uh, that, that we've luckily vaccinated a lot more of the population. Uh, that, and so we're, we've been successful there. Um, when we look at, let me show at a high level. <clears throat> so this is the United States as a whole. You can see that as a whole, the average, we're not doing so poorly, it's flattened out. We're starting to go over the last week or so, we've started to go up a little bit. And you can see that, and that's largely because of what we're seeing in the Northeast, Michigan, and some of these other states. Um, when we look over here, let me go to vaccines because it's interesting. <clears throat> So in the United States, um, let me zoom in on this a bit. So now totally 28% uh, of the total population has had at least one dose of the vaccine so far. 15.5% are fully vaccinated. Over the age of 18, so when you eliminate the kids, then 36% have had one dose. And when you look over the age of 65, over 72% 
of people over the age of 65 have had at least their first dose now, and almost 50% are fully vaccinated over the age of 65. So this is really great news, because when you're looking at those that are at highest risk, that means that we're doing really well among the highest risk. Um, I've seen some evidence that typically when you, when you go to any demographic and you vaccinate at least 30% of them, that's when you first begin to see the benefit. And when you start getting up to these numbers, so 50% totally vaccinated, um, that's that you start to immediately see. Even though you, you, so you do see a reduction in total number of new cases, but even more uh, uh, visible is the reduction in new fatalities or hospitalizations. Um, so I think even, let me see if I can break this down by vaccination demographics. Um, so this wasn't what I was looking at. I wanted to look at age over time. Let me see if it's vaccination trends. All right, so this is vaccination trends. There was something I was looking at Oh shoot, I forgot where it was though. I think it's anyway, so this is the distribution of which vaccines people are getting. You can see that there's been slightly more uh, Pfizer use of Pfizer versus Moderna. J and J is slowly coming coming in. I mean, they were much later to launch. Um, and I think this is largely just just based on uh, on which launch that Moderna and Pfizer just launched much earlier. Uh, Moderna was by uh, was was part of the U.S. funded approach. Pfizer uh, was funded by Germany, but we also paid. Uh, we sort of agreed to pay for their um, manufacturing, so, so for the doses, even though we didn't pay for the research uh, in the same way as Moderna. Anyway, let me go back to to global now. So this is U.S. Uh, I'll get into variants in a second. All right. So here is. Um, whoops. No, that is later tonight. All right, so here is at a glance, uh, the US, here, or rather the world. This is where new cases are happening around the world. You can see that Europe is doing very poorly. They're, they're having another surge right now. And so this is, so this is really, uh, they're in trouble. There, there's a lot of shutdowns that we're seeing in there now. South America, uh, it's actually the, the, uh, they're finishing up their um, summer now. So it's, it, it's equivalent to sort of like the end of September there in terms of their seasonality, because uh, it's a reverse of us. So it's really surprising that things are so bad there. And we believe that the primary reason things are so bad is because a lot of people are getting reinfected. Uh, so for instance, the Brazil variant, which is now common there, uh, is, is broken through uh, the shield of people who are previously infected. And so a lot of people are now getting reinfected. It's so bad that a lot of the hospitals are being overrun and they're running out of oxygen, which is even more basic than like, forget about ventilators and stuff like that. They don't even have enough oxygen in a lot of places. So it's really, really bad shape. Um, and, and yet they refuse to shut down, they refuse to, to do things. So it might become inevitable at some point. So a lot of us are, are paying close attention to Brazil. Um, we're worried because we don't want our summer to look like that or, or next year. Our vaccinations are incomparably more. Brazil has done a very, very poor job of vaccinating. In fact, Brazil is an interesting case study because previously they did pretty well at vaccinating for other diseases. Um, but now globally, there's been sort of this anti-vax movement that's sort of been really gaining a lot of steam where before it wasn't an, a movement. Um, now there's a lot of, of anti-science organizations that are specifically promoting falsehoods and, and, and competing and, and combating uh, the idea of science and trying to, to get people vaccinated. So it's, in Brazil, it's working, uh, and for, uh, unfortunately. And so there's a lot of people who are anti-science now in ways that they were not previously for other vaccines. Uh, but it's not just Brazil. I don't mean to pick on them. It's much of the country. I think we discussed last week that something like 80% of people in France were not eager to get the vaccine anymore after AstraZeneca uh, had that, had that halt uh, for a week or two. Uh, and so this is really problematic. Fran France is in, in Europe, France is seen as the anti-vax capital of, of Europe. And so they're, they're, uh, we, we need to work on that some. Um, you, but you can see that there's variation in terms of where the cases are going. The death rate is also varying. Some of it might be, uh, might be uh, reporting, but if we look at the confirmed deaths here, you'll see that the case that it's a little bit different, 
And here is where Brazil is really um, is really a lot worse. It's easier to if you do a poor job testing, then you're not going to see the cases as much. And so that's kind of a data issue, whereas deaths tend to be a little bit more accurate because people the, the countries tend to do a better job of, of measuring uh, the deaths there. Um, all right, when we look at vaccines globally, um, you can see here, here the darker it is, the better the, the countries are at administering the vaccines. Chile is doing quite well. Um, when you look here at the chart, uh, so this is doses, that's not what I want, I want people at least one dose. So, so here we have at least one dose. Israel at this point has, has done uh, at least 60% of the population has at least one dose. Uh, and that's the entire population, including kids. So the kids are not getting vaccinated. So that means when you look at the high risk population, it's quite large. Interestingly though, when you look at uh, Israel here, their, their caseload has plummeted over the last, um, over the last month or two. Uh, let me switch to here. To cases. Whoops. So when you look at Israel, you can see that it was really high. In fact, it was one of the highest peaks of the ones that we we're looking at here. And yet it's uh, even though it was so high, it's dramatically plummeted a lot faster than others. And it's on track to, to virtually eliminate it. And so within probably a couple of months, much sooner, most likely, um, that it will the, the epidemic will essentially be over in Israel. Uh, so that's that's really exciting news. So so what we're looking, we're eagerly looking forward to that because hopefully that will be the United States in a short period of time. Currently, the United States is here, and you said we were just looking at that short, uh, earlier. So you can see we're not doing so well now. Right now it's flattened, and then over the last week or so it's gone back up a little bit, whereas Israel continues to plummet. So hopefully that'll be us as we continue to vaccinate. Um, but um, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little while. We have enough vaccines that by the middle to end of May, we should have enough vaccines delivered that everyone who wants the vaccine will have been able to get it at that point. Um, and so then we'll be talking about trying to increase uptake among people who have vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so that that's going to be the big question in May in terms of how we increase that. And then following that is the question of people who are under the age of 16 or under the age of 18, uh, who, who then get, could get access to Moderna and Pfizer and get getting them vaccinated. And so that'll be the next step after that. Um, so right now, so here's where we are, 60% Israel, UK has around 44% have had their first dose, Chile 33%, United, uh, Bahrain is at 28%, and United States is roughly there as well, so, uh, almost 28%. Um, then next, it goes to Serbia at 20%, Hungary at 20 but then you see that it goes down pretty fast. And um, this is the first dose. When you look at the second dose, we're actually doing quite a bit better in the United States. So this is fully vaccinated. Um, you can see that United States is doing really well, Chile is doing well, uh, Israel is a very small country, so it's hard to see on the map. When we look at it as a chart, so Israel has around 55% almost uh, have been uh, fully vaccinated, Chile is at 17, United States at 15%, then Bahrain is at 14.4. You can see that it drops precipitously. UK, United Kingdom, which was like second or third in the world that we just saw, is now down, it's, it's less than 5% have been fully vaccinated. The reason was they, they made the decision to roll out the vaccine as fast as they could for one dose. Um, so they intend to give the second dose at some point, but they really wanted to get the, the numbers up to just get the first dose out there. The, one of the big reasons was for the UK variant, which is the most common variant in the United Kingdom still, um, that has shown big protection from the vaccine. So even a single dose for the UK variant is enormously protective. So that's important. For the other vaccine, uh, the other variants, the South Africa, pardon me, <clears throat> the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant, and others that we'll be talking about, um, the, the vaccines are not as protective. And so the worry is if you only give one shot, that you're gonna, it's not gonna be protective enough. And so as a result, you'd be sort of promoting this breakout sort of like, like antibiotic resistance, you'd sort of be promoting vaccine resistance if you don't have enough of a protective shield. With the two doses, even though there's a diminished response, the antibody levels are so high that even if it's 90% reduction in, in how effective the vaccine is, within at least the first three months or so, the antibody levels are so high that it's, it still probably doesn't matter on a clinical level. Uh, it's People might get sick, 
but it's not going to be enough for, for the vast majority of people to put them in the hospital or to give them uh, critical illness. All right. Um, so I just showed you this. Um, there's, it, you can see that there's a bunch of states that are now climbing back up again, and, and those are consistent with what we were seeing in, in what I just showed you in this one. Um, and so, so yeah, where, this is where we are. It's a snapshot of where we are now. Um, we're not out of the woods yet, for sure. Um, we're, I'm hoping, so right now we, we, were, we had the third surge. We're all hoping that we don't end up with a fourth surge, but we, so, so there's three. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty now in terms of how fast we can get shots in arms over the next month or two. Um, I don't, most people, most forecasts I've seen do not predict that we're gonna have any surge, anything like what we've had before. For the, the, the main reason is that this is a seasonality effect. Um, we're leaving cold and flu season. Cold and flu season usually ends by early, mid, late April. Um, and so because of that, uh, we're, we're seeing just, uh, just naturally a reduced uh, infection rate uh, in general. All right, so, so we don't expect a big, a big new surge. All right, next, let's, um, let's leave it there, Rebecca. Let's go and go into questions now. Okay. Lots of great questions this week. Thank you everybody for sending in questions. And if you have questions live, for sure, send them to me via the chat and we will work it into the conversation. Okay, Glenn, this may be a technicality, but somebody wants to know, what is the difference between a variant of concern and a variant of interest? Could you please define that for us? How often did new variants emerge? Does infection with one new variant protect against another new variant? Describe. A really, please. really good question. In fact, so now we've been talking about these two things, variants of interest and variants of concern. Now there's actually a third group. And so I'll get into that in a second, but the third group is called a variant of high consequence. So essentially a variant of interest is a variant that's suspected. So it has genetic markers um, that's, uh, remember if, you're, if you recall a variant is sort of a group of mutations. It's not uh, different enough that we call it a strain. So for instance, when we have the flu, we talk of different strains of the flu and that's because they're different enough that they're really, that we, we call them strains. A variant is not different enough. So they're not different strains. They're still overlapping quite a lot but they've, they've changed enough that we're viewing them in different ways because their behavior is different. And so basically, I'll, I'll just read out the definition here, but it's a, var a variant with specific genetic markers that have been associated with changes to receptor binding, reduced neutralization by antibodies generated against previous infection or vaccination. So that means it, it could be uh, resistant that resistance that you're seeing, reduced efficacy of treatments. So that's something else we're evaluating potential diagnostic impact or predicted increase in transmissibility. So it's more contagious or more severe disease. Like, like so for instance, like we're seeing with the UK variant. One thing that we haven't talked about previously is this potential diagnostic impact. And that's the worry that it could be the case. We haven't seen it yet, but it could be the case that variants emerge that mutate enough that they actually escape from our diagnostic tests. And so if that happens, then you could get the diagnostic test, say the PCR test, and the PCR test might start giving false readings, even worse than they were before, uh, went because the variant has sort of escaped from the tests. So that's something else we're looking at. A variant of interest is just sort of minor levels here. They're not massive, but there's something that there's a suspicion that there's something for any one of these that might be interesting, and that's why we're following it. And that's why it's called a variant of interest. In contrast, a variant of concern is the same as a variant of interest, but to a larger degree. So that means that there's some evidence, whoops, there's some evidence of widespread, widespread interference with diagnostic testing or evidence of substantially increased resistance to one or more class of therapies or decreased neutralization. So the decreased neutralization we're seeing in Brazil and South Africa, that's why those are variants of concern um, or evidence of vaccine induced protection from severe disease. Um, we are seeing that in, in some of these as well. There's also evidence of increased transmissibility in some of these or evidence of increased disease severity. And we are seeing that in the UK variant, for instance. That's why those three are generally seen as the variant of concern. Um, although I think the California variants, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, um, are also starting to be uh, getting that designation. Um, now the third one 
is variant of high consequence. And we haven't talked about this before. This is a new, um, a new label, a new grouping that we haven't seen. Currently, there are no variants that meet these criteria. But if, it's, if it becomes the case that a variant of concern completely breaks free and suddenly is no longer protected by the vaccines at all, or for any of these, it completely breaks three, free and is just this massive failure. So for instance, it's a demonstrated full failure of diagnostics or evidence uh, of these other things, more clinical severe disease, uh, more severe clinical disease, et cetera. Um, then it would be a variant of high consequence. Luckily, we have none of these variants yet, but we're, we're monitoring it. All right, um, currently, let me, let me show this. So these are at the United States level, this, these are the main variants that we're looking at. B1 was much more common earlier. This was January. Uh, so these were the, the variants that were commonly circulating them. B117, if you recall, this was the UK variant. This is more contagious and more deadly and more, more severe if people get it. And you can see how rapidly this has been advancing. So since February uh, or since January 30th, you can see that every two weeks, it's been increasing dramatically as a percentage of the total variants. Similarly, uh, B1526, uh, I think this is the New York variant, New York City variant. This has been growing dramatically. Um, the B1429, I believe that's the California variant. Uh, it's now a variant of concern. Also B1427, those are uh, both, both evolved in California, have very rapidly uh, increased. So you can see that when you compare March 13th, the week ending March 13th, so the week ending January 16th, just two months, you can see dramatic changes in terms of what variants are spreading around the country. Um, and so this is a, a big part of the explanation of why much of many of the states are not doing well right now. So New Jersey, uh, New York City, for instance, it's probably lar largely because of the spread. Um, let me see, I have a better, let me go to the website. All right, so here is uh, here are the current variants of, of interest. The variants of interest that we've been talking about are the New York City variant, which is B1526, B1525. P2 is another one circulating in Brazil. Th these are the three main uh, variants of interest that we've been looking at right now that we're tracking. The variants of concern are the ones we've been talking about, the UK variant, B117, the Brazil variant, P1, the South Africa variant, B1351, and these two California variants, B1427 and B1429. The variants of high consequence, there's currently nothing. So luckily uh, we're good there. Um, what I wanted to show is this. Let me scroll up. So variant proportions. All right, so this is the graph I was just showing. This, is, this looks familiar, we're just looking at this. But when you look break and break it out by state, you can see, so for instance, the California variants are, are over half in California now. They're, they're, they, be, they grew very quickly in California. Um, but when you look at New Jersey, for instance, on here on the left, this is the UK variant. The UK variant in New Jersey is now almost 10% and growing. And if you recall, the UK variant uh, has three traits that are unique to it. One is that it's much more contagious. Two is if people get it, it's much more severe so it's more likely to, to have severe illness and maybe put them in the hospital. But third, it's protected from the vaccine. So people who get the vaccine have uh, essentially full protection from the UK variant, which is good. Um, but you see that across the states, there's a lot of variation in terms of which what's arising. You see Nevada has a lot of the California variant in it. This one up here, B1351 is the South Africa variant, not spreading quite as fast as some of these others, which is fascinating. One of the most interesting things is that it seems like, oh, this is California. Uh, so not on this table, but in other news, it seems like in New York City, the New York City variant of interest might be out competing the UK variant, which another way of saying that is it might be more contagious than the UK variant, which would be a little bit worrisome, but we are tracking that. Um, all right, so let's look at that. The next is, um, uh, so that's the variants. Oh, the, the next question that we had over here was to uh, just to answer that. Does any does infection with any one variant protect from other variants? So that's interesting. So originally we were looking at the most common uh, variants that were out there before there were widespread diversity in the variants. One, there was a recent study that was just published 
looking at this question. And one really fascinating thing that they found is that people who were infected with the Brazil variant, that's 501YB2, uh, also called B1351 is the, what, what we uh, have typically been calling it. Uh, there's de several different nomenclatures for, for these that uh, it, it makes it a little more complicated. But essentially the South Africa variant actually is very effective at protecting for, against other variants. So an easy way of looking at it is if someone was originally infected or has the vaccine, but in this case, we're looking at the original infection, it is only roughly 50%, so 48% protective against the South Africa variant. However, if you go the other way, among people who, are, who are, were infected with the South Africa uh, uh, variant, it's 93% protective against the original variant. So that means that uh, in, the, in some of the booster shots that we might be looking at, it might be very, very helpful. So if we, if we end up needing a booster shot in the fall, then if we get one with the South Africa, Africa variant in it, we might actually be much more protected against lots of these new variants because it seems to be doing a much better job uh, going backwards, reverse compatibility as opposed to uh, front-wise. So this, this is pretty good news actually, I think. All right, Rebecca, next okay. question. Okay, so we'll take that. We'll take that bit of good news and I guess stay tuned on this booster information, right? Right. Um, remind us, what do we believe is longer that is longer lasting, the natural antibodies or the protection from the vaccines? The vaccines, definitely. Uh, so when people are naturally infected, um, they have, so, so essentially the way that I look at it, oh, in fact, I have a graph that I put together just for this purpose. Um, here. I, I didn't put this together. I got it from uh, this website that you can see down here. But it's a good graph, so I, so I put it up here. So essentially, blue represents people who are never previously infected. Red represents people who were previously infected. The dashed lines are, are the two mRNA vaccines. So when someone gets their primary vaccine, you can see that the red line uh, increases. So people who are previously infected do have a much bigger antibody response after they get the first vaccine. So it's another reason why people who are previously infected definitely, definitely should get the vaccine because it definitely boosts their antibodies and definitely boosts their T cells. So their immunoprotection increases everywhere. But then you can see that with the, um, with the, the um, vaccine, it reaches a high point with the dashed line, the red dashed line. So when they get their booster shot, it actually doesn't seem to really increase their antibodies anymore. It sort of like boosts it to the ceiling. Whereas people who are not infected previously, when they get their first antibody shot, the, the first vaccine shot, you can see that it goes up midway. Then when they get the booster shot, you can see it goes up again. And so then it reaches with around two weeks or longer after the second shot is when it reaches the same, the same point. So people who are previously infected and, or, or versus not infected when they get the vaccine. So definitely you can see that, um, that the vaccine is much stronger than natural infection, uh, but there is a ceiling that you get to. So it's uh, the people who are previously infected hit that ceiling after the first dose. However, the CDC currently is still recommending that people get the second dose of the vaccine. Uh, they might change that determination at some point. If they do, you, you will have heard it here first. It's because of these graphs like this, uh, but currently they, they, uh, they're still indicating two vaccine shots for everyone with mRNA, one shot for the J&J &J vaccine. Um, a, co a couple of other things here that were interesting. There is variation in the immune response by age. So we've talked about this in previous uh, previous weeks. Um, typically, as the as your uh, as people get older, their cellular memory doesn't persist quite as long uh, in terms of the vaccine shot. So it doesn't necessarily last. We're still looking to see clinically what that means over the months. We don't know for sure yet. The other thing is that for people who are previously infected, typically the more severe the disease that's the higher the level of antibodies that they have in their blood system. And so that makes sense as well. And so, yeah, so this is where we are with that question. Once again, a terrific graphic. And yes, we definitely have heard it from you and we've seen it from you first many times over these months. So thank you for, for keeping us apprised of so much good data before it even hits the general population. Okay. 
So we talk about the CDC a lot, right? And we look to the CDC for a lot of guidance. There was big news this week from the former CDC director, Robert Redfield. He said that he believes the source of the COVID-19 pandemic is the virus escaped from a lab in Wuhan. What is the evidence for or against this? Yeah, it was very unfortunate that he said that. So there is actually no evidence that this escaped from the Wuhan lab. Um, so let's go into that a little bit. He, in fact, he says there's no evidence. He just has his own feelings. The problem was he was the former director of the CDC and he should not be sharing things that have no evidence in, in, in basis. The, what we do have evidence for us, so let me share the evidence. There were original studies that were done. So if you recall, what we talked about this around a year ago already in terms of this, this topic of where the, where the virus likely came from. And we talked about there was a, a, a um, scientific organization called the EcoHealth Alliance. And what the EcoHealth Alliance did was they went around and uh, collected bats from all over China, but primarily, I think it was Southeast China, but, but I think from lots, lots, part, lots of parts of China. And they took saliva samples and blood samples of all these bats. And what they found, because they because this was after SARS, they were trying to see what the scope of the problem would be to prevent another outbreak like the original SARS, which happened around 2003 or so. And when they did this screening, they identified 400 completely new coronaviruses that we never knew existed. 50 of these fell into the same category of SARS and SARS-CoV-2, which is now what we're calling COVID-19. And so that means that it could be the case potentially, hopefully not, but potentially in a worst case scenario, instead of talking about SARS-CoV-2, we could be going up SARS-CoV-20, SARS-CoV-100, SARS-CoV-400. That would be terrible. The other thing that they found, and so that's, it's good to know this, that we could prepare for it because now we, we've identified the, the, um, the viruses. We have a whole library and in Wuhan, they had the library of all these viruses. But the main reason for me that's most compelling that it came from nature is that as part of this work of what they did, they showed that between 1 million and 7 million people every single year are exposed to these coronaviruses. So these, these 50 to 400 coronaviruses, one to 7 million people a year in rural China and Southeast Asia um, are exposed to these viruses. And so for me, the big question, if that's, I mean, we're talking about millions of people here. For me, the big question is, why don't we have pandemics more often? Given that there's so many out there, so many of these viruses, and that millions of people are exposed. And for me, the answer is that it's mostly in these rural communities that they're exposed. And so if someone's on a farm, essentially, and they get sick, who are they going to infect? And so because there's not very many people around them, it doesn't break out. And it's not so you get to the cities that you start a big epidemic and then you start seeing spread globally from there. So for me, just because something's obvious doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing. So there's still a potential that there is something else going on. But for me, this is really, really compelling evidence that there's, we, just, we know that the spread is occurring naturally in these millions of people every year. So for me, it, it's not a big leap to say, okay, well, and, and plus we already had SARS and MERS that happened in the last 15, 20 years. And so this is stuff that's happening regularly uh, with these uh, jumping either from bats uh, directly or from bats to other species than to us. So, so there's, no, there's no new evidence. There's no basis to think what, how it could have escaped from Wuhan. The one thing that he was citing was that some of the scientists who worked in the Wuhan lab got infected with SARS-CoV-2, had COVID-19 at the same time as other people in Wuhan did. But yeah, if there's an outbreak in Wuhan and the scientists live in Wuhan with other people who live in Wuhan, of course, there a lot of them are going to get sick. So it's it's for me, it's not really any interesting evidence. Everyone that I've spoken to, every other epidemiologist, thinks this guy is kind of a crank. Uh, not not like like a not not a crank in like just a cranky mood. They, he we, we he's just kind of a mediocre scientist. He's not he's not very good, and he's not preventing for providing evidence. What he should have done, if he wanted to be objective or be seen as objective is to give the sum of evidence and the, and the range of evidence and sort of say why he might feel one way versus another. But to just give an opinion like this without 
also stating that millions of people are infected with the coronavirus, uh, like SARS-CoV-2, every single year in China, it really makes it, it's, he's a, it's a bias that he's trying to, he's, an, he's advocating a position instead of being like what a scientist is supposed to be and just objectively say what the range is and what the most likely estimates are. So I, I, I'm disappointed in that. The one other thing, so, so now we, unfortunately, the, the uh, squeaky wheel is the one that gets the oil. We know Robert Redfield because of the, some of the silly stuff he's been saying. The new CDC director has been much more systematic, much more objective in what she's been doing. Uh, so I, just to bring her name up again into the conversation, her name is Rochelle Walensky, the new director of the CDC. She's been great. We haven't been seeing her a lot in the news. She's been doing a lot of stuff beyond the scene. She, ha she has been in the news a bit, but nothing, there's no controversies. There's nothing, she's doing everything uh, great by the book. She's, the, she's creating the new pandemic playbooks. Um, and, and it's really uh, a lot of great stuff coming out of CD. Even to the point, a lot of the data that I'm show, share, have been sharing with you now is all coming from the CDC website. Um, as, soon as, as soon as the new administration came in, one of the first things that they did was to um, dramatically increase the amount of surveillance, genetic surveillance that, you, that we've been doing. So you can even see, uh, so, so the new administration started January 20th or so. Uh, before that, there was very little genetic screening. After that, we dramatically pumped a lot of funding into in dramatically increasing genetic screening. So now we have more visibility, more eyes on the ground of what's actually going on with all these new variants. Because if you don't do the testing, the specific genetic screening for the variants, you don't even know it's there. So the, C the head of the CDC, this uh, Rochelle Walensky, uh, was driving. She's been doing a lot of great work with the data and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's been great. All right, Rebecca, All right. back to you. Glenn, thank you. That's really interesting about what Robert Redfield said and, and your perspective and, and that of your colleagues. So thank you for taking a deeper dive on that. So we've talked a bunch about bats. We talked about mink. We talked about a variety of animals. And I promised and I forgot to start this week's conversation about our pets. So let's go there. Pets. <laughs> Cats, dogs, can they be more susceptible to some variants of COVID? And if so, do we need to start making masks for them? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. So if you recall, one of the things that really differentiates the UK variant, this B117, was that it's much more contagious and much more severe. But the fact that it's more contagious means that there was a worry, well, maybe pets could get infected. And so for a little while, it was just seen as an interesting hypothesis without evidence. Um, and so, but now one of the, unfortunately, so the UK variant, in fact, let me go to UK real fast. Let me see if I can find this. So you, United Kingdom, if I go here, you can see that they had that really big spike, uh, not as big as the, uh, as the United, uh, rather bigger than the United States. They, but, and theirs was more sharp. You can see that ours went up slowly and then I uh, hit one, uh, crawled up to the peak, whereas United Kingdom sharply jumped up to a peak because it was much more contagious, much more transmissible. And the reason it came down so sharply was because they essentially closed everything down. They shut, did shutdowns again. Um, and so it was much more contagious. In pets, unfortunately, one thing that they found was that um, they saw a huge, sharp uptick in the number of dogs and cats preventing with in heart inflammation. So myo myocarditis, it's the inflammation of the heart. And so between December and February of this year, the incidence of, of myocarditis jumped from 1.4% to 12.8%, which is huge. And so right now, even though it's a hypothesis, that because we don't know for sure that that's what's driving it, it's very, very likely. Right? This right now, it's the most compelling hypothesis, the most, most likely reason is that in fact, uh, it's common that, uh, or to, to some degree common, uh, that cats and dogs are actually contracting SARS-CoV-2 from their owners. So what does this mean in the United States? Now that the UK variant is spreading more, uh, we just looked in New Jersey, we saw it was dramatically increasing around the United States. Each week it was getting, let me go back to the graph just so we can talk about the UK variant again. So the UK variant again was B117, you see it's like doubling almost each every two weeks. 
So that means that in New, in New Jersey, we just saw it's around 10%. In other states, it's more, some states less. Um, but what it means is it's going to become more and more the common variant that we see here. And this is the one that they found in the cats and the dogs. So what it means is that um, I, I don't know that masking the pets is something that's feasible, but, it, but what it means is that maybe if you see your neighbor's pets and you're masking yourself, maybe we should not be petting our neighbor's pets as much, or we should keep more physical distance between the pets. Right now, there is not evidence that you can catch the virus from the cat or the dog. But what I presented is compelling, but not it's not definitive, but it's compelling that the cats and the dog can, can catch it from us if we get infected and it causes illness in them potentially. We saw that dramatic increase in inflammation of the heart in these cats and dogs. So, so this is definitely something we need to be aware of. Um, and so it's, it's out there. That's, that's where we are with that. Oh, goodness. I don't like that news. <laughs> I, yeah, sorry. I didn't, well, I wish it was good your news. Fault. It's not your, we never hold it against you, but no, we don't like that, but it's important that we're armed with that information. So, right. And, right. Right. and that's another thing. If you're a cat or a dog owner and you have a neighbor who might like petting your dog, maybe for the next month or two, we should be not having them near our pets as much. And what does, what does this mean? If you, have a, if you have someone who's a dog walker, for instance, or someone that comes into your house and feeds your cat when you're away, maybe we need to make sure that they wear masks. Maybe before they were taking their mask off when they were away from people, but when they were with the dogs and cats, they had their mask off. Maybe we need them to be wearing their masks when they're the cats or the dogs. So. All right. Good to know. Very yeah. good to know. So let's move from our pets to our children. And specifically, let's talk about college age students. If college, some colleges are now requiring vaccine for the students to return, I think right here in New Jersey, Rutgers was the first one. Is that right? Yeah. So college students are responsible for a lot of the epidemic. Um, so if these colleges are now requiring that these students get vaccinated, when will they become eligible for the vaccine? That is a good question. So first, let me go. I'm looking for demographic trends. There it is. And I'm looking for this over time. And so my computer is a little bit slow right now. There it is. And then I need age. All right, so we've talked previously. You can see that the, uh, the green up here, the, eight, this, the dotted green lines are the 18 to 24 year olds. So these are people in college. These by far are the most, uh, the people spreading it the most. Right below them, which is not too different actually, the dashed lines, are, oh no, wait, do, uh, yeah, the dashed uh, uh, lines that are not the dotted ones are the 25 to 34, and then right below them are the 35 to 54 year olds. But you can see above everyone, and in fact, in some ways, the leading edge, the dotted lines, the 18 to 24, are the leading edge. They precede each of the surges. So when the, eight, when the college students, the 18 to 24 year olds, essentially, they, they start spreading it, and then the other age groups sort of start getting it from them and so they, they, they tail behind them. So, so we, that's, this is an issue. And so the sooner we can get them vaccinated, the better. Um, the, right, so we talked a little bit earlier, by May, we should have enough vaccine that everyone should be able to get it by the end of May, just based on the rates that we're doing. We're almost, we're hitting roughly 3 million people getting doses a day which is amazing at this point. Um, it's be, I think between two and a half, three million, it varies a little bit. The other thing is that we are, there's a, a new study that's taking place. If you know any student that's attending any of these schools, uh, so here's the full list of schools, Charles Drew University, Clemson, Indiana, I'm not, I'm not gonna go through all of them. But if you see on this list, any student, you should recommend that they sign up for this study. They'll have uh, potentially access to the vaccine before other people get it. So they could potentially get the vaccine within a, a few days. Um, and the point of the study is to see if, if getting the vaccine reduces transmissibility. So right now the primary driver, the primary reason we've been pushing the vaccine is because it reduces severe illness. We were unclear about whether it reduces 
whether how contagious it is, whether people can infect other people, this, this transmission question. And so this is the first big study looking at the group that we need to evaluate the most, the, the, the college age students uh, to see. So if you know anyone, they're recruiting, uh, they're shooting for 12,000 people. Uh, they'll be able to get the vaccine very rapidly. So if you know anyone, please, please recommend that they sign up. The, the website here is below, uh, preventcovidu.org. Um, and so, but, but so I think we're gonna start seeing this rapidly. The big question is gonna be vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so, so trying to figure that out in, in this group. But so, so this is going to answer one of our big questions once we, once we get these people vaccinated. Um, essentially what we're gonna be asking them to do is to be uh, getting uh, diagnostic tests very frequently. I don't, I don't know if it's daily or somewhere near that, but we're gonna be trying to just give them lots and lots of diagnostic tests to see with a lot of precision whether there's any, um, any change over time in terms of that transmission rate. Good to know. And I guess, you know, be, here we are well over a year into this and, you know, people are asking about long-term effects. And I guess, you know, so many of these st studies have been going on, maybe not in students like this, but for well over a year, do we have any other information about kind of the safety, the efficacy, any concerns? Have there been any red flags that have so, been predicted? Yeah, that's a really good question. So essentially, um, the, the vaccines that have been approved with the emergency use authorization have demonstrated that they are both safe and effective. Now, and by both, I mean safe and effective for all the vaccines who have met it. The difference between an emergency use authorization and the uh, a, a actual approvals or without, the, without an emergency uh, uh, waiver, uh, if, if you will, is that the emergent is that the, uh, it requires to be approved, formal approval, requires more years of follow-up and, um, and, and sometimes tighter uh, constraints, but it's typically the years of follow-up that you're looking at. However, given the thresholds that we've met with safety and efficacy, um, we, we would have met those, those standards almost certainly, even if it was full approval. Uh, we're still doing follow-up and it's studies like this that we're looking at on the screen that are really gonna demonstrate this. From my perspective, I don't look at these vaccines as sort of like science juice. Some people think of vaccines as science juice and worry that there's an additional risk from the vaccines that's somehow different than getting COVID-19 itself. The only issue that I could foresee is if someone got COVID-19 and there was a long-term consequence of that that we were unaware of. So we have this idea of long COVID. What if among people who got COVID-19, God forbid, but people who are naturally infected, what if we found out that it increased the risk of cancer 10 years from then? Then there might be a slight risk that people who got the COVID-19 vaccine might also have that enhanced risk 10 years from after getting it. However, the problem with COVID-19 itself is that the risks were so severe with the acute severe illness and dying that either way, it would be better to get the vaccine than risk getting infected. Because these variants are so contagious, people who did not get the vaccine would very likely be infected at some point. So even under that hypothetical situation, it's still better to have gotten the vaccine than not. That's helpful. Thank you for clarifying. So, Let's talk about more about folks who've gotten the, the vaccine. And I, like many of you, probably have seen, seen folks post their pictures of their, their vaccine passport on Facebook and other social media. And should folks be cautious about sharing their photo or the information on their COVID ID, uh, their COVID vaccine card? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So there's two answers to that. First is that it might uh, actually become official documentation at some point. If we end up needing sort of this vaccination passport, then that means you don't want to share too much information online because someone could potentially take it and make a counterfeit version using your information. So sort of like a driver's license, you wouldn't want to post your driver's license online because then someone could take it, put their own picture in and then pretend to be you. 
And so there's a worry there of someone counterfeiting it and falsifying it, that that's, that's a legitimate worry. The other worry, which I think in some ways is a little bit more worrisome, more scary, is that for a lot of these vaccines that require two doses, if you post your information that you've gotten your first dose, then they could potentially, uh, if there's a, a bad actor out there, they could potentially reach out to you claiming to be the vaccine site and saying that there was a problem with your vaccination. Could you please verify your social security number? And if they give you all the information, reading it back that you provided, your vaccine dose number, the date and the exact time that you got it done, the vaccine center, your name and, and your birth date and everything, they'll have so much information about you just from your ID card that you'll feel, oh, it's the vaccine center calling you. They, they know who you are. And you and so a portion of the P population might give them their social security number, for instance. And so you don't want to ever reveal social security number on uh, to anyone who calls. There's no reason for anyone who calls that you ever have to give that. So uh, that would be another worry that there could be scam artists out there. Once they have your social security number, they could potentially apply for credit in your name and do other things. So that's something that we need to worry about. Now, going back to the question of the vaccination passports. So we actually do have vaccination passports for other diseases. An example of this is yellow fever. And there are a lot of countries that require you to get vaccinated for yellow fever before you get to go there. So for instance, here's a, a list of a lot of countries that require this, the, the vaccination uh, for yellow fever. And when you go, you need to demonstrate proof that you've gotten this vaccination. So this is not going something that's super new. It's something that we actually do for other diseases already. And it's, it's definitely something that could happen for, uh, for this vaccination, particularly because there's wide variation around the world in terms of the vaccination rates. And so when it comes to tourism, work travel, et cetera, this could be something that it becomes interesting. Domestically, I don't know how that might play out. We are seeing some companies like uh, Krispy Kreme and other companies that are, uh, if you show the vaccine card, then they then they grant you uh, maybe privileges. Uh, I, we might see, um, you're, you're right, you mentioned Rutgers as an example requiring vaccination. We might see airlines requiring vaccination for them. It's in their interest to demonstrate the safety. And so for them, even if they might restrict access to people who are not vaccinated, uh, it might make it more likely that people who are vaccinated might be willing to fly and go on vacation. So it might be worth it from a business point of view. So, so yeah, there's, there's definitely business cases that I could see for this. So it's, it's likely to be coming. It's not clear what the full extent of it will be then. All right. Okay, so that's helpful, Glenn. Thank you for, for letting us know we should guard that information closely like any other piece of documentation, right? With It's got a lot of personal information, even though it might be random numbers and a QR code, we wanna guard that. Exactly. Okay, so a question came in from our audience about the AstraZeneca vaccine. We talk a lot about Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J here in the US, but of course, there's been a lot in the news lately about AstraZeneca. And the question is, uh, has AstraZeneca has been criticizing, criticized for cherry picking data for reporting? And thank you to Harry for submitting this question. What do we know about that cherry picked data? Is that true? Um, it's not really true. It's, it's, a, it's what they've been criticized for. So here's what happened essentially. AstraZeneca was approved for use in Europe and other places, before it was approved in the United States. The primary reason for this was that the clinical trial was not complete yet in the United States. So we didn't get approval in the United States yet. Uh, AstraZeneca partnered with Oxford. And so Oxford of course is in U United Kingdom. And so they prioritized there getting the clinical trials out, et cetera. So that's why it was rolled out in Europe first. Um, our clinical trials in the United States just finished up uh, within the last couple of weeks, uh, the last few weeks. And so, AstraZeneca then applied for emergency use authorization for the vaccine in the US. In their application, they had an end date of some time, I think it was early February, maybe mid-February, but it was, it was a, a, maybe a month ago or so. That was before the big worry that hit Europe, where they were worried about the, the blood clots and this other stuff. And so even though originally it probably would have been sufficient to just end the clinical trial review at that point in time, like a month ago, 
just because they had co uh, accumulated enough data at that point, it probably would have been sufficient to just cut it there and just submit that for the emergency use authorization. However, because all of this stuff happened in the last few weeks in Europe for the blood clot worry and everything that turned out not to be an issue, um, the FDA here um, decided, no, we, we want full information on that in the United States. So they, so, so they required, uh, so the FDA required AstraZeneca to show all additional data that they have in the most recent few weeks of any possible signal that might be happening. Um, it's for me, I see it more as a formality. I think that it demonstrates that the FDA is doing their job and looking after our backs. I don't think AstraZeneca was a bad actor here that they were cherry picking data. I think that they legitimately had a case to just stop it when they did because it takes a lot of time and effort to collect all this data, put it into the reports, proofread everything, whatever. Like it takes time and, and hours of, of, of actual people working on these reports. And so, so for me, uh, it makes sense that that was just a business choice that they made. But it, I think FDA, you can see they have our backs. Their, their purpose is to work for the American public. And I think AstraZeneca is very happy to go along with that. And I, th I think it's, it's great what they did, what, what FDA is doing. Excellent. Thanks for clarifying that for us, Glenn. And thank you for that question, Harry. So we are at the top of the hour together. So many good questions have come in. Glenn, shall what? we end with, with the gym question? Is that okay? Unless that's there's something great. else. No, this that's, been, that's terrific. Let's do that. The, the reason I say this is because it's been, um, people have been talking about it for a few weeks. They've been asking some questions. So I figured, why don't we punctuate it and have the conversation here? I'll just spend a few minutes on it. Um, so essentially, this there's been a, a, a bunch of outbreaks of gyms around the country and around the world. Um, and so the question is, well, what's the risk? Uh, it's easy if to have when we when we looked earlier at these peaks, whoops, when you see these peaks previously, the surges, yeah, it makes sense that you'd have outbreaks back in December or January when there was a lot of, of uh, virus, pardon me, virus circulating in the communities. But that now the virus seems to be so much lower, is it really the same risk? I mean, so first of all, before I even go into the gyms themselves, uh, going back to what I was just saying in terms of not that in terms of this, which is not showing on my screen, you can see that th it's not the case for all, for all the states. Some states are still going up. All right, this is not. So, so New Jersey, for instance, is, well, we can't see very well, but New Jersey is still going up, which means that gyms would be at the same risk that we were thinking about back in Thanksgiving. So whatever we, we were doing back in Thanksgiving, we should probably be doing that same kind of re re restrictions now. In particular, when we look here, um, what should we be doing and what shouldn't we be doing? First of all, I'll give an example. Um, here's an example of uh, uh, high intensity interval training. Uh, I don't know that it was a CrossFit gym itself. Uh, it was just described as a fitness facility in Chicago, uh, but essentially it was high intensity interval training. Two people ended up getting sick, uh, taking classes during that time uh, in, in the same gym. And then over the course of, of what is this, a, a month or so that of maybe a little bit longer that we're looking at uh, in terms of, or, or maybe not quite, uh, so, so less than a month, but a few weeks that we're looking at, um, a lot of people got infected at that gym just from those two initial cases. Uh, ultimately, it was around 68% of the people who got infected. They were following all of the requirements except wearing masks. They were indoors. In fact, to the point that they were worried about infecting each other with the equipment. And so they actually, everyone in the class actually brought their own weights and their own mats, um, but not everyone wore masks. Some people who are concerned brought, wore masks, but not everyone wore a mask. And yet 68% of the people in that facility uh, ended up getting infected with COVID-19. We, we saw it in South Korea, uh, in Zumba classes, we saw it in spin classes, we've seen it in other types of these high intensity. The main reason is that in high intensity interval training or high intensity fitness classes, uh, people breathe harder, which means that the people who are exercising and potentially at risk or potentially have it as a case are much more likely to spread it if they're breathing much more deeply and breathing more intensely. And the people who are uh, not infected and are doing exercise are more likely to get it if they, if they get it because they're breathing much more deeply and more rapidly and whatnot. And so there is a big risk. So the question is, let's dig into this a little bit more. Whoops. So some of the questions are here. Um, 
do fans help, for instance? And so fans actually only help if you have large circulation. It has to be cross ventilation. A lot of CrossFit gyms, for instance, might have big garage doors or big open on one side. But if it's only open on one side and not on another side, then you don't really get the cross ventilation that you need. All it does is recirculate the air inside. And that actually might increase the risk because any virus that might be there is just recirculating in circles around the room. So even if you have tall ceilings, that might be the case. The other worry here is uh, the, with the cases being in, indoors is if you have one class followed by another class followed by another class, you could have a case that leaves the first class. So they were infectious during the first class. They leave, a whole new class comes in that is not, uh, no one is sick there, but you might have the virus recirculating in the room and persisting for a couple of hours or longer. Even though you have the fan on, it's still recirculating in the room. And so potentially that's another potential source of infection inside the room. The question of how far apart should I stand? It's probably different. We've talked about six feet. That probably does not what we're talking about when you're talking about high intensity fitness. Again, because people are breathing much harder, it means your force of air out goes further than you would typically be talking about in just com in a normal conversational breathing level. Um, and, and also people who are breathing in have, a, because you're uh, deeper, a lot of people are talking about 10 feet or more. I have a website here. Uh, there's different uh, rules by state. This is the website, the IHRSA Association, the International Health Racket and Sports Club Association has a really good website showing state by state what the different uh, regulations are in terms of capacity and that kind of stuff. It does change, like each week it's changing because the states are coming out with different rules, uh, but this is currently the most recent that I saw. Uh, so New Jersey, it's supposed to be one individual per every 200 square feet uh, of floor space essentially that you're looking at, it's supposed to be 35% at the, of the capacity uh, in New Jersey, but, um, but this is based on, and, and based on our current level of spread and the current level of, of transmission of how contagious it is. A couple of other questions here that I'll get into just very briefly are, um, are here. So does the type of exercise make a difference? Um, so if you're doing yoga versus high intensity, yes, the higher the intensity, the, the, the more the breathing, the breathing is the key thing. The higher the breathing level, the more the risk. So if you're doing weight training, but there's not a lot of high intensity cardio involved, then it's not the same risk. It's much lower risk than if you're doing the cardio with the high intensity breathing. Um, is there a way to monitor the air? Yeah, so there have been carbon dioxide monitors that people have been using in various facilities. I think that there's a cost associated with it that might be prohibitive. If you have extra money to spend on the air quality, it's probably better to work on the cross ventilation and getting the air up. The best solution here still, now, especially now that the weather is getting nicer, is to work out outdoors. Anyone who can work out outdoors and, and be physically distanced enough outdoors, it's dramatically reduces the risk. Even taking off the mask, but still being physically distanced away outdoors, dramatically, dramatically reduces the risk be, versus being indoors. A huge difference. Um, the question, what if you've been vaccinated? How does that change the risk? Um, people who have been vaccinated should obey the rules of whatever the gym is that they're going to. So the risk is probably lower uh, both of transmission and, and severe severity of disease, but whatever the rules are of the gym, they still need to obey those rules, wear the mask or, or whatnot. Um, next, do I need to wear a mask? Yes, I've just said that. People should be wearing a mask. If you really don't wanna wear a mask, you should be working out outdoors. It's, it's just hard to, to get past that. The outdoors, uh, dramatic, I can't emphasize this enough, working out outdoors dramatically, dramatically reduces the risk. Um, does cleaning and disinfection make a difference? It seems in some, it makes a tiny bit of a difference. I see it as not nearly as important as other respiratory things that we talk about in terms of physical distancing, being outdoors, wearing the mask. This is a respiratory illness. At first, around a year ago, we thought that cleaning the surfaces of stuff was more important. At this point, we know a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of transmission are suspected of possibly being from touching things. Those vast, vast majority of spread is breathing it and through the respiratory component. So the cleaning and disinfection, yeah, 
do it, but it's really not going to make much of a difference. If you can do anything at all, focus on, like if it's a choice of wearing a mask versus disinfecting, it's night and day. The mask is going to make much more of a difference in terms of someone getting infected. The disinfection is really not as important in that sense. Um, how will I know if a room has adequate ventilation? Um, there really should be, it shouldn't, the, the air shouldn't be stale. Um, it should be across ventilation so that the air is moving. It can't just be that the fan is recycling the air. It has to really be moving through cross ventilation. Finally, uh, how many people should be in the class? I refer to what I just showed you there. Each state has different regulations and part of it makes sense. Uh, I just showed you uh, the, that the states are varying in terms of how much uh, spread there is by the states. And so as a result, it makes sense that, that states should have different regulations. States that are doing uh, not doing as poorly should uh, you might have a little bit more freedom in terms of how many people can participate in a class. Whereas states like New Jersey that are doing quite poorly should probably have more restrictions than others. And so with that, uh, I will leave it. Um, if you have any other questions about this, we can answer them in later uh, weeks. But that's that's pretty much where we are with this. High, in, in terms of the risk of doing different activities, currently high intensity interval training and, and these uh, high intensity fitness classes tend to have higher risks than, than other types of activities. Also, information we don't want to hear, Glenn, <laughs> but <laughs> we're not blaming the messenger. It's important that we understand the difference here in these types of classes and what's safe and what might not be as safe. So yeah. the good news is that the weather, except for this rainy day, is getting nicer here in the Northeast, and right? The, the key thing is it's these are not hypothetical things. These are actual gyms where they've been tracking, they've been doing the contact tracing and tracking it. And you actually see it in real life where there's tons of examples at this point of this massive amount of spread. I mean, we're at 68% of people getting infected. This, this is massive, this, this is outbreaks. This is, these are super spreader events. And so because we know it, we're seeing it in the United States and abroad that, that we know that this is something we need to be aware of. All right, we don't hold it against you, Glenn, but we're, we're glad to be armed with the information as always. Okay, so we are going to leave it there. Please, everyone, keep sending your questions into Glenn. It's really helpful. I, as you can see, Glenn does a lot of preparation for these conversations. So whatever questions you have during the week, definitely send them on to Glenn. And thank you, as always, for being here tonight. We have a wonderfully engaged audience. And thank you to Glenn for all of your preparations. Everybody be safe, be happy, be well, and have a great week. And we look forward to seeing you same, ta same time. Maybe Glenn and I will be in different places. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks care. everyone. Have bye a great bye. week. Bye-bye.